peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. In our gospel lesson from John chapter 15, Jesus refers to himself as the true vine. We are branches. And then he goes on to mention a certain word over and over and over again. The word abide. Abide in me and I in you. Abide in my love. Abide in my word. Ten times. And so you know this has got to be important. And what does he mean when he says abide? Well, basically this. He says stay connected to me. Key word there, stay. Stay right where you are. Stay put. Don't move, right? Abide in me and I in you. Stay connected to me. Abide in the vine. That's what a branch does. It doesn't move. It doesn't stray. It doesn't go away. For it to grow, for it to thrive, and more importantly, to bear fruit, it must remain right where it is, in the vine. That's our identity. We're the branch, he's the vine. And when you think about it, right, we have many identities that we carry around with us in life. And those identities, they're always formed by the relationships we have. A person may have the identity as a teacher, another as a student, right? And together, that identity is formed because of that relationship. It's teacher and student, or husband and wife, employer and employee, parent, child. Today, Jesus reminds us of what our first and foremost identity is in life. We are those who are connected to Christ. We are those who bear fruit for Christ, right? Branches connected to the vine. And the world should never see us apart from our identity in Christ. Just like you can't look at the branch of a fruit tree and not see the whole tree. And so it is that we should never be known as just a teacher, but a Christian teacher, a Christian student, a Christian husband or wife, a Christian employer or employee, right? The world always sees Christ connected to us. And why? Because we're connected to him. And Jesus says, let's keep it that way. Abide in me. Stay right where you are now again branches serve a purpose for the tree they bear fruit what good is a branch that bears no fruit I mean anyone here who does actually know how to do grafting like I talked about earlier knows that a good branch is one that's going to bear good fruit that's why you take it from one tree and graft it onto another if a branch fails to bear fruit you cut it out there's no point in keeping it there it's only going to shade out the other branches and I think the part of Jesus' words today that may bother us a little bit is when he talks about that very process taking place among the branches connected to him, that if a branch bears no fruit, his father will come and cut it away, throw it into the fire, or at the very least, severely, at the very least, rather, severely prune it. And I think it makes us wonder, well, what kind of branch am I then? Indeed, I don't think... Any Christian ever goes very long in life without sometimes wondering spiritual questions along that vein. What kind of branch am I? Am I being a good enough Christian for our Lord? I mean, after all, look at my life. Look at the things I've done recently. Look at the choices I've made. Look at uh, my situation in life. How can I be of any use to God? Is he ready right now with the shears, ready to cut me off, ready to prune me back no indeed it can be a scary thing sometimes when we think about the will of God toward us and when we base God's will toward us on the things of this world on the circumstance of our life or on our performance maybe if I tried harder I'd be a healthier branch maybe God would bless me more Maybe this is why I see all the trouble. Maybe this is why I feel so depressed. Maybe this is why relationships in my life are on the rocks. There's something I'm doing that's not bearing fruit for the Lord, and so I need to do something different. Try harder, or he's going to cut me back. And you better believe Satan loves to hear Christians ask questions like that. And so I think before we look at anything else in our text today, we need to establish up front, first and foremost, Clarify what this illustration, this metaphor Jesus is using means for our lives, that he is the vine and we are the branch. And I think it's very similar to the metaphor he used last week in our text, John 10, when he talked about himself being the good shepherd and us being the sheep. If you remember, we talked about how it is that livestock in general, they need 
someone to take care of them. They cannot take care of themselves. They don't have the survival skills or the instincts to do it. Sheep are maybe the worst. They sometimes seem to have a death wish if there wasn't someone constantly taking care of them. And so it is that Jesus uses that image of livestock to describe us. We need someone to feed us, someone to take care of us, someone to lead us. And so it is today Jesus uses a similar metaphor. The relationship between the branch to the vine, except here's the difference. Sheep are prone to wander, but a branch never leaves. A branch is connected always to the tree, to the vine. And that's what Jesus says we should be always connected with him. Indeed, we are always connected to him. And why? Because Jesus says in verse 15, apart from me, or rather in John 15, apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, how are we connected to Christ? Well, baptism. I mean, is that not how the scriptures speak of baptism? We've been sealed in Christ, grafted into God's family, adopted as one of his children. Holy baptism is that work that God does to make us his own. Consider what Paul says in Romans chapter 6 when he talks about what baptism is. He says, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death. In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united, united with him in death, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Paul is saying that we're so tightly interwoven with Christ now because of our baptism. That when God looks at us now, he cannot tell the difference between Christ's death and our death. Christ's life and our life. Indeed, Christ's death for the sins of the world becomes our death. We no longer need to die for our sins. Indeed, our death now, the death that we will all one day experience, merely becomes the gateway to eternal life. We have nothing to fear from death because Christ has already died for sin, for our sin. And so it is that the new life that Christ lived after his resurrection becomes our new life even now. We are connected, interwoven, grafted into, connected to, Jesus Christ in our baptism. And if God has done that work, he has not done it incompletely or imperfectly. And so Jesus says, stay right where you are. Abide in me or remain with me. Don't leave, don't move, don't become disconnected. Stay right where you are. And of course, the devil and this world for sure, and even our own sinful desires, they love nothing more than to try to help us, tempt us, to think otherwise. That there is something wrong with our connection to Christ. Something incomplete. We talked about those questions of doubt that we sometimes are plagued with. Questions that we consider when we see trouble in life. Or when we look at our past and see things that we regret or feel guilty and shameful about. We're deceived into thinking that somehow we've got to do something more, invest more in the things of God, and then we'll be better connected to him for the future. Sometimes this gives us reason to boast. Right? We may look at our life and see all the things that we are doing that a good Christian should do, and, well, certainly, then this means I'm connected to Jesus. Someone like me could say, well, I'm a pastor, right? Surely I'm connected to God. I'm a professional studier of God's word, right? It's my profession. I'm a scholar of God's word. Or someone like you may say, I do my devotions every day. Surely I am a good branch connected to the vine of Jesus. I'm always in his word. Maybe someone may look at the way that they serve and volunteer and work for the ministry and the various church organizations that they serve in. Look at all that I do. Look how nice I am. Look how good I am to my neighbor. Surely I'm connected to Christ. Indeed, it can cause us to boast. It can cause us to think that indeed we have to do something to seal the deal with our Lord. But remember what Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Indeed, any time our understanding of ourselves as children of God rests on what we have done as good enough, I'm a good enough Christian because look at how I serve the Lord, then that's red flag number one. There's something wrong here with our relationship with him. 
Indeed, like we said the other way around too, when we look at something we have done and think that now this has separated us from Christ, that we're not worthy, we're not good enough anymore for our Lord. Again, red flag number two, something's wrong with our understanding of how we are connected, how we are related to Christ. In fact, sometimes I think it's our own Christian vocabulary that does us the most harm, especially the adjectives we like to use to describe our life with Christ. Right, we like to use words. American Christianity in general likes to use words like more or greater or true or further or higher or more authentic, real, nearer to communicate our connection with Christ. I have an authentic relationship with Christ. And why? Because I do such and such. Or I'm striving to, to, to be higher, more faithful, truer to the Lord. See, these adjectives, they stress what we're doing, the efforts we're making. Or they make us look at our failures, right, and see how, uh, how pathetic we've been. <laughs> it teaches us that it's the vine's job to try to connect itself to the branch. Oh, I'm sorry, the branch's job to connect the vine. The vine is the life source. And the gardener is the one who does the grafting. The branch can do nothing. Indeed, a branch that is knocked off by the wind will wither and die unless the gardener himself comes and does something to give it life, grafts it back onto the vine. And that is how each of us are, a vine, a branch rather, that is destined to wither and die if we were not connected to the true vine. In fact, that's a universal rule of sinners like us, and we're all sinners. We're destined to wither and die apart from the true vine, Jesus Christ. And so it is then that as Christians, we've got to be intentional in, in reminding ourselves of what connects us to Christ. And it is not us. It's Him. I think this is sometimes really important for Christians when they're going through really difficult times in their life. Health is declining. Or maybe they're facing some disability or maybe because of age or health or the disability, they're homebound or can't be as mobile as they used to be, as active as they used to be. And so often they're prone to wonder, what purpose is my life, right? Why doesn't Jesus just take me home already? What good am I doing here now? Maybe you've heard your own parents say that before or a friend. Well, the answer is they're doing exactly what a branch does. They're abiding in the vine. They're thriving, and why? Because they're connected to where they need to be, to the Lord. And because they're a branch, whether they see it or not, and whether they feel it or not, they have fruit to bear, fruit that they will bear, because that's what a branch does when it's connected to a vine. It bears fruit. Now, of course, the second danger, I think, that Satan and this world and our own sinful desires sometimes cause us in our life with Christ is they sometimes tempt us to intentionally try to disconnect from our Lord. Right? God has so intentionally connected us to himself through baptism and through regularly feeding us with his word and sacrament. But how often we're tempted to try to disconnect, right? We're the ones yanking at the core, trying to unplug ourselves from Christ. You know, when Jesus told his disciples, if you obey my commands, you will abide in my love. They weren't the only ones listening that day. Satan was listening, too, and taking notes. And Satan has learned very successfully how to keep Christians from abiding in the love of the Lord and how, by slowly tempting them and teaching them to disregard the word of our Lord, right? His commands, what he's called us to do. I mean, how often do you hear Christians say things like, or maybe you feel it yourself sometimes, I don't really need to go to church to be a Christian. Right? I mean, yeah, I, I know I should go to church, and, and I will from time to time, but it's not like it's really that important. It doesn't matter if I'm in church or not. I can still believe, I can still be a Christian without church in my life, without Bible study in my life, without the sacraments in my life. What a foolish thought. That's like a branch saying that it can cut itself off from the vine and live apart from the vine for, from time to time for a while. It's absurd. It doesn't make sense. And Jesus says the same of us. In fact, a thought like that would never come from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit would never pit the church against her Lord. The 
two are together, right? The vine and the branch, the church and our Lord. And it's through the ministry of the church, it's ministry of word and sacrament that we are fed. Through Bible study and through, through all the various ministries that, are, that churches do. We need each other too. The encouragement that we gain from other Christians who remind us in those moments when we're tempted to doubt our connection to the Lord that no, you're a branch and you have fruit to bear. Hang in there. I'll walk with you. The Lord loves you. I love you. Don't let Satan beat you down. You know, if we don't know God's word, Jesus says we can't abide in him. Plain and simple. I remember years ago when Jay Leno was still on TV. He would always do those man on the street interviews. I remember one time he went out and he did a segment on basic Bible knowledge. For example, he approached one college aged girl and asked her, he said, can you name one of the Ten Commandments? And she thought for a second and then she said, hmm, freedom of speech, right? Bill of Rights, not Ten Commandments. He asked another woman, can you complete this sentence? Let he who is without sin, what's the answer? Come on. Cast the first stone. Very good, right? But the response he got was, have a good time. Right? He turned to a young man, asked him, who in the Bible was swallowed by a whale? Jonah, all right? But the man's answer was Pinocchio. I mean, again, how can we stay connected to Christ if we don't even know what his word is about? And boy, it's amazing how often the Bible shows us just how little we know about the Bible, right? Even myself, sometimes I'm surprised. I'll read a passage and I'll be like, good grief. I don't know that I ever recognized that or saw that or learned that before. The Lord continues to speak to us, continues to work in our lives through his word. It's like the sap that flows from the vine into the branch. But again, this world also teaches us that it's good for us to plug into other things as well, right? And so we'll yank that cord out of the Jesus socket and plug it into something else for a while. This is important, right? I've got to take care of this now. This is a priority in my life right now. And our connection to Christ does exactly what happens when a branch falls off the vine. It withers. Indeed, we don't have the inner resources or the capabilities to be self-sufficient. We can hardly do that in the physical realm, much less the spiritual realm. And so it is that that temptation that I don't need God's word or I don't need the church to be, to be a Christian is simply a syndrome that is making Christianity unhealthy. You know, our goal in life is not to see how little of Christ we can get by with and still be connected to him. Our job is to see how much of Christ we can receive. How much of Christ can I fit into my life? And the answer to that is it's unlimited. He never ceases to give us more and more of his grace. It's why he feeds us each week with his very body and blood and gives us all the resources we need to hear and learn his word. From, from sermons on Sunday morning to the devotionals that our church produces that you can take home and do to the various websites that you have on the internet that have God's word and present it faithfully and true so that you might grow, that you might be a healthy branch and more importantly, that you might bear fruit. And you will bear fruit. That's what a branch does. The Holy Spirit will use you in the various opportunities and circumstances of life to be a witness to Christ. So that when people see you, they see the whole vine. They see all that Christ is because of you. And so stay where you are. You're connected to Christ. Abide in him and he will abide in you. That is the key to a fruitful and a blessed life. In Jesus' name. Amen.